So, the beginning of the, 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 the climax of this is Lady Macbeth's effort to take control. And Macbeth is again talking about his hallucinations, and Lady Macbeth simply says, who was it that thus cried? And there's almost, this, you know, again, a sense of distance. Because she keeps asking these questions that Macbeth is, that Macbeth is, that Macbeth is unable to respond to. And it's partly because she's thinking of this literally. She hasn't necessarily realised that this reported speech that Macbeth continually uses is, is, is a hallucination. No one has really said these things. And that she is thinking of this again along literal lines when she says, who was it that this cried? She assumes that it has to be a real person. And so she isn't fully capable of understanding the extent of his guilt. She says, why, worthy thing, you do unbend your noble strength here. So we see this sense of his strength as being metaphorically represented as some kind of metal that's being lost through conscience. You unbend your noble strength. I think that comes back to his origins as a kind of violent, powerful soldier. She sees this as unraveling that strength and that power. And then she says to think so brain sickly of things. And this is really interesting, what we'd call a compound adjective. No, it's actually, I'm wrong. It's a compound adverb. It's not an adjective. It's telling us how that something occurs. So it's a compound adverb, sorry. And irrespective of the word class, it shows us that she, she's thinking of things not in terms of how they feel when you're undergoing the experience, but of the effect of them. So she's not worried about the nature of morality. She's purely worried about the consequence, the way that it makes the brain sick, rather than the, you know, the, I don't know, the brain painful way of feeling this. So she's got this sense of, of only worrying about the effects of morality, rather than the morality itself and the experience of being in moral pain. So it shows you that, again, that she's, all she's worried about is the consequence. And then she says, go get some water and wash this filthy witness from your hand. On the first level, this is a, a very clear order. But it, again, c captures, I think, the motif of cleansing that is important in the play. The motif of cleansing, which is about washing away sins. But what she wants here is to wash away the the effects of the past and the effects of this trauma. So again, it identifies his conscience as the cause of his grief because it's washing this filthy witness from your hand. And it, it, it's, it's representing the blood on his hands as an actual witness that can see the, the nature of his crime. And it's that filthy witness that he is supposed to be washing away. She then says, why did you bring these daggers from the place? She's concerned again with the practical details rather than the moral effect. Obviously, he's done this because his, his mind is all over the place and is disoriented because of the, the effect of trauma. And she, she reminds him that he's supposed to leave the daggers in the building because it, um, it's part of their plot to make it seem like it was the, the, the servants that committed the murder. And then she says, go carry them and smear the sleepy grooms with blood. And these are all imperatives. She's, taking, she's issuing orders that demonstrate her power over him. And we'll see this a little further down as well. And then we have that sibilance again, the smear the sleepy grooms with blood, that she's almost taking pleasure. You know, using these, these dramatic verbs and adjectives gives, gives a sense, I think, of her pleasure in this particular action of the plotting. And then Macbeth simply says, I'll go no more. I'm afraid to think what I have done. Look on it again. I dare not. And I think the simplicity of his language here the simple declarative sentences. I will not do this. I am afraid to think. I dare not do this. Show us, I think, the loss of control of his thinking and that his, his mind is, is, is elsewhere. I don't want to think about what I've done. I don't want to look at it again. And then this is where Lady Macbeth criticised him, infirm of purpose. This exclamation associates sickness, infirmity, you know, the state of being sick, with a lack of, of pragmatism, of being pragmatic and practical. She then says, give me the daggers. Again, she's talking in imperatives, taking the situation into her own hands. The sleeping and the dead are but as pictures. It is the eye of childhood that fears a painted devil. 
If he do bleed, I'll gild the faces of the grooms with all, for it must seem their guilt. Now, importantly, what we see here is what we I, I briefly mentioned above. Pictures painted gild and seemliness and the eye. This is about, this is almost art. And, and this is what we see, I think, above when she says, go and carry them and smear the sleepy grooms with blood. There's a sense of pleasure. She's seeing this plotting and the, and the assembly of the crime scene almost as, I think, a type of um, art, a, a type of, of representation. I think that Lexus of art shows the way she's disconnected from the reality of the murder. She sees it as some kind of weirdly creative act that she's engaging in by creating this, this crime scene and by plotting in this way. And when she says the sleeping and the dead are but as pictures, this particular simile gives us the sense that these sleeping and the dead are lifeless representations. She sees them merely as, as, as in, inanimate objects that are just representations of human beings. And I think that says more about her own inhumanity than the people that she's describing here. She says, it is the eye of childhood that fears a painted devil. It is simply a, a child that fears someone that's being represented through art. But of course, a painted devil is, is precisely what this is not. We're talking about actual dead bodies here. And that she, I think, is trying to deliberately emasculate Macbeth here. You're a little child if you fear a painted devil. But of course, this shows us this artistic, almost extended metaphor and lexical pattern. Shows us that she's not thinking of this as, as reality. She's thinking of it as a representation. If he do bleed, I'll gild the faces of the grooms with all, for it must seem their guilt. And this is a really unusual um, choice of phrase here. It must seem their guilt is really ironic because it will, what it seems to say, there's an irony in me using it as well, is that it will suit their guilt to be smeared in blood. But of course the irony is here that this is the reverse of the truth. So it may seem appropriate, it's precisely not what is occurring. It is the opposite of what's occurring. The, the, the servants are not guilty, it's them that's guilty. And they are talking here about deception and the reverse of truth. So the seemingly, the seeming suitability of the blood on the face of the servants, suiting their guilt is ironic because it's precisely the opposite of what's happening in reality. And then there is this knock. And Macbeth just doesn't respond to her plotting here and just says, Whence is that knocking? How is it with me when every noise appalls me? And so here it shows us his paranoia, the, the repeated questions show us his disconnection from Lady Macbeth and also his sense of, of, of almost edgy fear. And then he talks about his hands again. What hands are here? And this is this extremely powerful image that he ends on. He says... Ha! They pluck out mine eyes. And this, I think here, description of his hands being personified here gives them a power, but also a sense of sensory confusion that his hands, in their awful violent state, are personified because they pull his eyes out. They basically, they, 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 they almost want to stop him from being able to see at all. And this is almost like Lady Macbeth's desire for, you know, the knife to not see the wound that it makes. He doesn't want the capability of vision because the, the, the truth is so horrifying. And then Macbeth ends with this enormous, um, enormously powerful image. Will all great Neptune's ocean wash this blood clean from my hand? And this is a classical allusion a reference to classical mythology and the god of the sea, Neptune's ocean. That whole ocean, could it clean my hand? Could it wash that filthy witness from my hand that Lady Macbeth keeps drawing attention to? So this invokes the vast scale of his destruction, that even the entirety of the ocean couldn't clean his hand because of the scale of the crime that he's committed. And he answers his question, no, this, my hand, will rather the multitudinous seas incarnadine. So my hand will instead incarnadine. This is a verb. This is a, 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 a neologism that Shakespeare created. He invented this word, incarnadine. It means to make something red. It will make red the multitudinous seas. So something complex and multitudinous and various will become simply red, making the green one red or making the green one 
red. So again, we have that washing motif here in this final image of his hand not being cleaned by the sea, but rather painting the sea itself so that it shows us metaphorically the, the consequences of violence spiraling out of control. And that washing motif is important here because it's reworked, but it's reworked to failure. His violence has destroyed the concept of purity. The purity of water and of the oceans has been permanently destroyed by the violence of his crime. And so what we see here, importantly, I think is a failure on Macbeth's part to transform, a failure to respond to Lady Macbeth's pleas for practicality throughout this. And really a movement simply from a reluctance to think about the issue to a very frank nightmarish, almost poetic representation of the consequences of his violent actions.